everyone live and here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is gonna be, you know, hybrid, okay? Um, hello everyone. I mean, the, I have the great pleasure to present to you today, Professor Theodosius Stasius. Um, I, I made an effort to condense his broad and wide bio, okay? Uh, professor Tassius is an emeritus professor of the National and Technological University of Athens in civil engineering. But I would have to say that this is a very limited perspective because he is what I would like to say a homo universalis. <laughs> he has been a member of the Academy of Sciences of Torino. He is doctor on our honoris causa of Lee's University, University of Nanjing. Cyprus University, the National Competition University of Athens, the Pantheon University, the Agricultural University of Athens. He has served as an expert and consultant of the United Nations organizations and for the European Union. He, is pres he has been president of international scientific so societies and he is honorary president of the Hellenic Society of Philosophy. He is author of over 500 papers and 60 books in several languages. And, uh, well, I guess we can agree that he's a legendary figure. <laughs> uh, I would really like to stress this uh, one last uh, key point. Uh, he is president of the Society for the Study of Ancient Greek and Byzantine Technology in, uh, in Greece. And uh, he has offered us a great understanding, much deeper understanding of the ancient Greek technology uh, through massive work in the field and through constructions which one can find in museums in Athens. Um, Professor, it's such a great honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, um, good morning, ladies, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. And I'm thankful to the organizers for this kind invitation. Um, and since uh, English is not my mother tongue, you will bear with me uh, to read my manuscript uh, uh, in order to keep to the time allocated. Um, given that, Technology is daughter of necessity. This is it's the saying of Moschion, a, a, a poet of the third century BC. It follows that in emergency situations, such as the wanderings of Ulysses, there are even more needs that cannot be met with natural means and require artificial ones. Even gods, when in need, invent. Remember how Hephaestus, uh, let me see with my transparencies now. I try to, to put my first. Your slides? My first uh, uh, slide. And, but it doesn't obey. We will make it obey. <laughs> Sorry for this. Uh, is it okay? But, oh. then, but then it will produce some problems to me because I'm not seeing it. Oh, no, no, we can see it. We can see it. We're good to go. Yeah, but I can't see it. But anyway. Oh. Let's continue, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was saying that, um, remember how Hephaestus met the need to deal with his innate lameness with his two spectacular artificial helpers, handmaidens wrought of gold in the semblance of living maids, Iliad. While in dealing with the most striking adultery of all time, and then I wish to put my second uh, slide. We try here to to make it also. Anyway, 
Are you able to put on the, the second slide? Uh, we cannot see the second slide yes, yet, but uh, if you just press this, the next button, it should show up probably. Sorry for that, just give it a second, sorry. So maybe what you ask him to share it small screen or something? Maybe, but there, there's a person there. Do you have a copy of this? This is the first. What we present now is the yes. first. We can see it, yeah, it's, that's perfect. And then we go to the second. And I was saying that, that Ephesus, dealing with the most striking adultery of all time, he had no natural means, the poor guy, and resorted to the technological invention of bonds which might not be broken or loosened to trap Ares and Aphrodite in bed, Odyssey. Similarly, as the persecuted Ulysses closed the seas for years and years, he needs to measure himself against natural phenomena and unnatural gods with the tools of Promethean philanthropy, that is with wisdom in the arts, Protagoras. Even more so since it originated in the head of his favorite goddess, Athena. Admittedly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the aim of this lecture of today is to entertain you mainly, uh, but uh, putting together the relevant incidents helps us realize the role of technology in ancient life and perhaps even more in our own life, especially considering that technology uh, comes first and the economy such as it is these days, follows. So you will remember how our man most wretched above all Odyssey was now spending time in Calypso's wonderful island, which even Hermes, upon arriving, stood to gaze and marvel and delight his soul, Odyssey. Not to mention that Ulysses and Calypso had a grand old time by night, by night <laughs> relishing their joy of love, abiding each by the other side, Odyssey. And don't be misled, the modest translation, according to Eustathius of Thessaloniki, love of Homer means copulation, clearly. Yet, Ulysses yearns for home, and the truly magnanimous Calypso helps, helps, helps him build the ship to take him there. Of course, we can't expect Homer to know all technical details of how the big ships were built in the age where his narrative is set, but he still provides several important technical details. First of all, it is not a raft. It is not a raft uh, in today's sense of the word. Ulysses logs first reach into the sky, Odyssey, while the poet also speaks of the bottom of the ship, a deck, long gun whales, Odyssey, and close set ribs, Odyssey. Let's see the sketch on this. Indeed, if Tathios interprets the Homeric raft as something ship-like, distinguishing it from later shallow rafts. The timber employed were namely alnus, alder, easy to cleave, humidity resistant wood, poplar, fir, easily processed, fine quality timber, is primarily easy to process the top priority to uh, in an emergency situation and with only one builder available as in our case. Let me say, however, that the delicate poplar was only meant for the deck. The poet shows a striking persistence 
with the dryness of the woods and is saying long, dry, and well seasoned. Homer confirms the long established technique. And first the hull was formed with the curved planks, then the transverse ribs were fixed. The planks were joined along their length, cutting mortises into which tenons, that is hard wooden plates, were driven and fastened with wooden dowels, this system of joinery being called harmony. It's not poetry, it's carpentry. <laughs> Thus, the man of many devices, as he is called in the poem, uh, this is also a detail of the uh, wooden towels into which uh, bronze and, and nails are inserted. Uh, I was saying that uh, the man had built his small ship and launched it full of joy. Even the sails of precious linen were a gift of Calypso. With a heavy heart, she gives him some navigation pointers too, based on the position of stars, Odyssey. These instructions suggest to us that he must have sailed off in late spring. And in any case, from somewhere in the West Mediterranean, since she stressed that he should always keep the bear on his left, literally. Let us not go into the tribulations of the hapless man until he was washed up by Poseidon on the island of Sieria. In fact, Cassians. Yet, as Ulysses lay amidst the foliage by the little stream, the maiden Nausicaa came to wash her lavish clothes. Odyssey. Quote, when they came to the beautiful streams of the river, where were the washing tanks that never failed, for abundant clear water welled up from beneath and flowed over to cleanse garments, however soiled, along the eddying river. Let's have a sketch on this. This is the main flow, the obstacles, and the 80 lines. In the attempt at a scientific explanation of the water's special cleaning powers with the help of Professor uh, Matistas in these vortices comes as a counterpoint to the ensuing idyllic scenes. Why is it that the Phaeacians had chosen as the city's laundering place the spot where the river formed vortices? Well, firstly, the presence of a permanent whirl requires some obstacle in the flow. And in order to be, this is the obstacle, so to say. And in order to, to be able to put in a garment before the obstacle, you need a sloping surface. This is a sloping surface. And uh, this is the way that a sort of cavity occurs, a bowl-like formation. And then if we follow the idea of a bowl, um, a rapid superficial flow over such a cup produces the following hydraulic effects. On the horizontal plane, a swirl occurs, a circular motion with a dip in the middle, the whirlpool. On the vertical plane, invisible to us, 
two opposite wells of water are formed, as you see. And the compression within the cavity, because of the pressure, produce, or because of the, of the motion, produces air bubbles like smoke. So within this small space, the intense three-dimensional differences in velocity of water layers produce powerful shearing forces, friction that is, which cause pronounced tensions and distortions all over the garment, dislodging the dirt. It's what an electric washing machine does. And now for Homer's little present, how do you think he describes this useful and abundant water of the vortex? He says in one single compound word that it flows beneath and up and over. It would be hard to formulate a more three-dimensional, let me show, I, transparency, a three-dimensional, a dynamical, dynamic verbal image, thanks to the incredible power of Greek pre prepositions, eupo, ek, and pro. The Greek term used is ip, ip ek pro rei. And uh, Nosika, the terrible weather beaten man who comes out from the bushes, does not frighten her. She stands still and listens to his poetic eulogy. Never yet did such a tree spring up from the earth. He tells her the cunning. The Greek races passion for technology, ladies and gentlemen, already since prehistory has been thoroughly researched scientifically by now. And uh, it is attested to in the major Mycenaean achievements in land reclamation, construction, metalworking, and shipbuilding with the timeless design of the ship Pentequater up to the, to the Battle of, of Salamis. It was a passion deep enough to figure in their religion or early enough, while their mythology is full of various contraptions and wonders, such as the automata and robots that run around Olympus in Iliad. And all these were human yearnings, surely, but in the epic poem, only the hands of gods could make them. So, here is the admittedly imaginary revolution in Ulysses' admonition, where men would dare to take it upon themselves and even against the world shaker's displeasure, Poseidon that is, to build self-sailing and self-thinking ships, or robots that is. We are on the Phaeacian's island, a technological place, Par excellence, the epic poem has already praised their technological achievements. Remember, in metallurgy, in uh, harbor building, in weaving, and in uh, sustainable all year round agriculture. So, They seem to be, the Phaeacians, the best suited for a revolution of shipbuilding. And it may be no accident that the might of mind, arche, arche nos in Greek, necessary for all that, is personified in their king Alcinous, who puts on Ulysses on his way back to Ithaca, I brought some unheard of ships. And this is the harbor, a imaginary presentation of the harbor of Phaeacians.
this is an imaginary um, uh, sketch of this uh, peculiar ship. They discern the course you have in mind with their own wits, needing neither pilots nor steering oars. They understand the thoughts and minds of men. They are hidden in mist and clouds, and in any case, not ever have they fear of harm or ruin. It is obvious that the Phaeacian ship goes beyond the definition of an automaton. It is not pre to for to perform a task the same each time, but has its own reprogramming abilities, communicating with the user, partially supplanting man, and changing behavior when faced with dangerous natural conditions. But this is a definition of a robot. So I submit that in the melting pot of the so-called dark ages, perhaps, Greek technical prowess would mature to such an extent as to dare hope that it would be man rather than gods who would reach the robotic culmination of technology. Indeed, after all, Aristotle himself continues to have this hope a few centuries later if every tool could perform its own organa, he says, organa for the tools of the machines. If every tool could perform its own work when ordered or because it had prescience, masters would have no need of slaves anymore. With the ordered tool being an automaton, and the one having prescience being a robot. Moreover, what we have here is a utopian, utopian faith of technology's power for social liberation. Ladies and gentlemen, some 1,800 years before Campanella's Città del Sol. Coming back to Odyssey, I will assume that the poet, perhaps mindful of hubris, allows for the possibility of divine intervention against human technology. Nevertheless, no such risk transpired during the height of Hellenistic technology when man at last did realize the automata of Ctesivius, Philo of Byzantium, and Hiron of Alexandria between the third and the first century BCE. Now, let's go to the case of the sleeping cyclop, the wine and the steel. Lately, thanks to Mrs. Kuraku, we have lost faith in the idea that Ulysses may have gotten Polyphemus dead drunk. Remember that the only wine our hero had, and plenty of it, was the gift of Maron, the priest of Apollo in Thrace, since Ulysses has spared both the sanctuary and the priest's family. But what wine was it? And quote, and as often as they drank that honey sweet red wine, he would fill one cup and pour in it into 20 measures of water and a smell would rise from the mixing bowl, marvelously sweet, unquote. Sweet wines in antiquity were made of grapes that were previously sun-dried until part of the water had evaporated and this made the most much sweeter and the wine more viscous so it needed a higher dosage of water when it was mixed. Maron's wine was of such honey sweet variety. Yet, these sweet wines cannot contain more than 2%, only 2% alcohol, 
upwards of a certain sugar content, a European grade of 15, you say, yeasts cannot perform their breakdown mission. So the alcohol content falls and the sugar content increases. What such sweet wines do cause, however, is just blouting, as Dioscorides tells us. So how could you hope to get a giant drunk on a mere three even dowels of dark wine? Highly unlikely. Still, why would you need wine when the previous day the voracious Polyphemus had fallen into stupor sleep after a meal, even a meal of milk, milk alone? It was a, a sleep so deep, remember, that Ulysses had thought of killing him on the spot with his sword, but then you remember uh, there would be no one to, to unseal the cave. So he postponed it. Thus, the events of the drama have no need of the non-existent inebriating capacity of honey sweet dark ones. This was a little bit uh, uh, food chemistry in uh, Odyssey. Yet, before leaving the cave of Polyphemus, let us not forget Homer's confirmation that Greek tribes had long entered the age of iron, since the poet explicitly mentions how hot iron is immersed in water to turn into steel. Uh, these are uh, some of the, uh, the automata uh, we have produced. Uh, which this is the um, uh, the, uh, 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 the moving servant of a philo of, uh, um, of um, Byzantium. And um, it is not only an automaton, but uh, I have used some of the uh, texts of uh, here of Alexandria, and we made uh, the, the same automaton to walk to the client. But this is another lecture. Uh, and this is the scene where uh, um, I'm referring to. And uh, I was uh, reading here that hot iron is immersed in water to turn into steel. Uh, the hot steak, the uh, friends of uh, Ulysses drove into the Cyclops eye Coat, as when a smith dips a, a, a great axe uh, uh, or an adze in cold water amid loud hissing to temper it, for therefrom comes the strength of iron. Even so did his eye hiss round the stake of olive wood." Unquote. Uh, and let us take pleasure in the Homeric seas of Thalmos in Greek, seas of Thalmos, with the clearly onomatopoetic verb reminding us of the English sizzle is the same. So now I skip uh, over um, some details of the recipe of the cocktail of Kikion if you are interested in. And uh, I go to the, uh, uh, how to the chapter where the uh, Ulysses managed to escape Scylla or Scylla, if you want, and heard of this. It was thanks to the appeased and compassionate Circe who had described the terrible whirlpool that awaited him. Today, we imagine it to be in the Straits of Messina between Sicily and Calabria, both the morphology of the sea bottom with the deep tectonic fault and the strong tides may account for such phenomena occasionally more than anywhere else in the Mediterranean. 
an, extend, an extensive swirling of water in the three kilometer straits, like a huge vortex, that is a large dip at its center, could potentially suck in a ship that sails into it. Let us attempt to describe the phenomenon without mathematics, helped, however, by Professor Batistas, although you will have to bear with some simple mechanics, please. Once a water mass M capital is set in circular motion due to a combination of obstacles or differences around the middle of the straits, in addition to its weight, beta Greek small, this mass is subjected to a horizontal centrifugal forces, force phi small, and their resultant, the resultant force slants a little outwards. Hence, the water surface in that area being perpendicular to the resultant force ceases to be horizontal and leans slightly inwards. The same thing happens throughout the circle. So a first dip is formed in towards the center of the created vortex. And the vortex is ready with a small or with great depth. Imagine now a vessel, a ship, which is colored red in this picture, approaching the area. It is not a simple mass of water. In addition to its vertical weight, the B capital, the ship is subjected to buoyancy A capital perpendicular to the now oblique water surface. Moreover, as the ship enters the swirl, it is subjected to a smaller centrifugal force phi capital. The ship is thus subjected to a resultant delta Greek capital, almost parallel to the sloped water surface. Take a moment to examine this little sketch there. This delta force is pushing it, the, the, the ship down towards the center of the vortex. We have lost it. Unless, unless we pay attention to the divine source's words. She said, at the Plankte rocks, ships are hurled confusedly by the waves of the sea and the blasts of, ben of painful fire. At the foot of the cliff, Harivis sucks down the black water. Mayest thou not be there when she sucks it down. You are better off sailing close to Scylla's cliff and as fast as you can. A speedy passage is best. So as Ulysses sails from the west and enters the Messina Straits from above, knows what to expect, first of all. Following Circe's advice, he sails as close as possible to the craggy coast of Calabria, because away from the center of the vortex, the speed of the swirl is much lower, and thus the slope of the water is reduced. The same persist, persist, persistent piece of advice urges him to go as fast as, the, as he can. In other words, step up your oaring to get out of the spot before force delta capital can draw you in for good. Before it was time to pull you down, you will have progressed far enough for the swirling speed to be almost nil. So Ulysses instructs his captain, quote, and to the steersman, I give this command, since thou wilt 
the steering oar of the hollow ship. From the, this smoke, there were the bubbles, and surf, keep the ship well away and hug the cliff, lest ere thou know you, thou know it, the ship swerve off to the other side and thou cast us into destruction." Unquote. Every word in these verses, ladies and gentlemen, echoes the spirit of our preceding analysis. And uh, yet our hero made it. And <laughs> I'm uh, pleased to tell you that uh, you made it also, uh, arriving safely to the end of uh, the journey of this lecture. And uh, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Tashis. It was such an honor. And I have to say, and I, I don't know if you agree with me, I've read the Odyssey a dozen of times, okay? And after this lecture and having dealt with that a bit, I feel like I have to read oh, the Odyssey again. <laughs> and I guess this is um, this presentation is an example of the great marriage between humanities and the positive sciences or technological sciences. Let's see the... Because it, gives us a much more perspective, yes. deeper perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, the floor is yours for any questions that may arise, both from the live audience and from the virtual audience. Um, feel free. I guess we need, Professor, I guess we need to do a lot of homework in order to understand the mechanics <laughs> in yes. order to, <laughs> to press I, I, admit, I admit that this was a, a rather difficult uh, point of the lecture. Oh, no. But uh, I, I, I take oath that this is real mechanics, yes. Oh, <laughs> we, we will believe you, we believe you. It's just, uh, oh, we have a question. Yeah, thank you. Oh, great. Uh, there is a question, Professor, can you hear me? I hear um, you, but I don't hear the question. Okay, I'll 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 transfer the question. Uh, um, there's a question whether there are resources where people could find more about the mechanics, I guess, yeah. around the the technology, around the Odyssey, and I guess in general. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, uh, yes, specifically regarding the uh, the Straits of Messina. And the vortexes uh, is uh, Dr. Batista's, Professor Batista's uh, uh, paper, uh, uh, and you may find it uh, just by, by, by his name, F-A-S-T, Batista's in the United States, where more details can be found. But for the uh, technology in Homer, in the epics in general, uh, there is uh, 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 an um, a, a sufficient uh, uh, a literature in uh, in several uh, papers and in books. Uh, some of the books being, uh, uh, especially in Europe, uh, very old. Uh, so I sub I submit uh, you just make your search by uh, putting uh, Homer technology, and this will uh, uh, guide you somehow. But it is obvious, you see, that since Homer somehow reflected the situation of, roughly speaking, a Mycenaean, Mycenaean world, that technology was incorporated in the epics very extensively. And you have other, other also regarding, for instance, um, um, the uh, several other details of the weapons. And in my uh, book uh, on uh, uh, the, uh, the 
ancient Greek uh, military technology, which is under press actually in Greek, um, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to analyze uh, the, uh, the mechanics and the resistance and the uh, function of some of these weapons. Anyway, um, I may be more helpful by writing if you wish, but uh, at this moment, uh, I, I hope that this is uh, enough. Thank you so much. Is that, yeah. And yeah, and if you are ever in Greece, uh, you can visit the Heraklidon Museum. It's a museum that professor has done massive work in, in, in Greece. Heraklidon Museum. It's in Athens, yes, it's in Plaka. Uh, so there is there are a lot of constructions of ancient technology. And we have one more question. Yes. Uh, yeah. You asked Professor Bosco, he had to generalize what is the difference between ancient and modern attitudes towards technology oh, based okay. on his years. Great. Um, uh, Professor Tassos, we have a question from from the president of Baidea, Jason Pedicone, <laughs> uh, to get you to get you acquainted. Um, and the the question is whether, from your years of experience, you have seen a difference uh, of the attitude of people towards technology uh, during the ancient times compared to the modern times. A difference in attitude of people towards technology. This is an enormously interesting question. I'm afraid I have uh, no clear answer to give, but I'm very, very much personally interested in this. Um, I have a rather long paper on the uh, selecting the opinions of all uh, ancient Greek writers regarding the epistemology of technology and regarding of the usefulness of technology, regarding the the, the very fact that technology was offered as a, as a gift from gods, after all. And this partly answers to your question, because the Greek tribes have a feeling that uh, technology is a complement of nature. And therefore, since nature was created by gods, it is obvious that even the complement of nature should also be created by gods. And therefore, you have the Promethean myth and I'm referring to the last version of the Promethean myth, which is presented in Plato's Protagoras. And let me add it here, this is not, may not be that known, that Democritus himself had before Plato, his own opinion about the anthropological development of technology in humankind, without any deistic intervention, anyone. And the others of Sicily, uh, there is a, 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 a text which uh, is uh, completely um, uh, considered as belonging to Democritus, where you have the whole history of creation, of production, of development of technology, without the intervention, any intervention of God. This partly um, uh, answers to your question that the Greek tribes were rather favorable for technology. And uh, even Plato as an idealist, in Timaeus, uh, am I pronouncing correctly, Timaeus in, in English? Yes. Uh, in Timaeus, you have, he, he, he dares Plato to describe God's work in very, very many detailed um, um, examples, the way human carpenters or, uh, or um, smiths, etc., are doing their work. So this is a kind of sec sacrification of technology and and and, and this I, I consider it if you if you go through the details of Timaeus you will see that Plato himself was very respectful of technology besides Aristotle himself in his text especially in Mechanica Problemata 
in uh, Mechanica, yep. which I strongly believe that it is a, a, a real, a genuine work of Aristotle's. Um, there, he, he, he offers a very technophiliac aspect. And uh, I have the intention to, to believe, the tendency to believe that uh, even the, um, the, the entire population was in favor, except for instance, Xenophon. Xenophon, is it the correct uh, yes. accent? Yes. Um, who, he was an aristocrat and slightly fascist, uh, who uh, is believing that, uh, that uh, technology uh, may produce very bad effects in the soul of the technicians. And uh, I'm not going to further details in these aspects. Uh, anyway, there were exceptions, but uh, Greeks uh, were rather uh, favorable, especially during the Hellenistic time, where uh, like, uh, thanks to the cosmo cosmopolitic uh, um, scale of uh, the uh, powers of the kings, uh, there were favorable conditions for, for technology. Today, to end my very long um, answer, and I apologize for this, today uh, our people's uh, attitude towards technology is, I admit, very controversial. Uh, take the example of the definitions of technology. If you had any book to read, a, a uh, definition of technology, you may read several nonsenses sometimes. Instead of saying just that technology is nothing else that, than when somebody needs to uh, serve, to satisfy some human need and natural means are not sufficient. So we have to invent a pinoin. Okay some artificial means, and this is technology. Anyway, I understand that I was too talkative and I'm not oh. sure that I have completely answered your question. Thank you so much. Um, we do have another question, should I go for it? Or I don't know, regarding the time. We're fine. We're fine. There's, okay. there's two. Section. Okay, okay, great. So we do have Professor another question. Um, it's broken into two sub questions. So I will transfer it as I read it. And if you want, I can further explain. Um, the question is this, accepting that sweet wine has a lower alcohol content, and that Odysseus and his men would have diluted it for themselves. Did they dilute it for Polyphemus as well? This is the one part. And no, 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 they, they have not. They okay. have not because, uh, oh, 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 I, I don't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. There are no details in the poem. No, I don't know. Uh, because I guess that uh, they wouldn't mind very much about the health of Polyphemus and <laughs> they, <laughs> <laughs> they could just offer him uh, 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 the um, in in uh, the 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 sweet the very sweet the very sweet directly without diluting it. Okay, great. Uh, th there's a second part of the question, but I think you've answered to that as well. Like, and if unfamiliar with wine, would that undiluted wine be sufficient to in inebriate him? But I think you must have uh, answered to that already. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank it, you. It's not. It's not an abbreviating. No. The yeah. Scurridis, the Scurridis also also is 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 very is very clear about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a last remark. I'm not sure if it's a question, but I have to transfer to you. Um, it says like Professor Tasio's remarks suggest the Jan Marx thesis on Democritus is worth revisiting for that point about technology. This is a, a remark, a comment on your lecture. Could you repeat it for me, please? Yes. Uh, Professor Tassi's remarks suggests that young Marx thesis, 
young Marx's thesis on Democritus is worth revisiting for that point about technology. Oh, yes, uh, yes, certainly yes, certainly yes. Although Marx is not that uh, uh, detailed about uh, this part of the of the of Democritus work, uh, but uh, but still is closer to the uh, hylomorphic uh, 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 um, attitudes of Democritus. Yes, and 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 Lefkipas, of course. Right. Thank you. Is there anything, any other question? Probably. I think we're. We're good to go. Thank you so I'm much. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Twelve times. Twelve. We we are grateful and we're so glad we, we had you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody from the virtual audience. Um, that was it. Um, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye there.